Yeah. And you are showing what is your role? I'm a site reliability engineer. Good afternoon. That was entirely planned. We wanted a fuller room. Now we have it. Uh, we had no problems whatsoever. We have Sherwin from Rabobank, uh, product owner for cloud, as well as SRE, kind of jack of all trades, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Give it up for Sherwin, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining this uh, last Friday, last talk. I hope you had a great uh, day today. I saw some really interesting talks as well. Some of those will tie into what I'm going to show you today. So I want to talk about Kubernetes in the enterprise. Uh, what does it mean, Kubernetes in the enterprise? Well, first of all, uh, let's talk about what is the enterprise. So for me, I'm a, like a technologist at heart. So what I thought the enterprise is, is just like, um, yeah, dusty old uh, uh, people sitting at the cubicle farm, something like this, right? Who thinks about when you see an enterprise? Who thinks about this? Show of hands, yeah, like, that's exactly what I thought, right? <laughs> and, but when I got older and I saw what people actually do and the processes, like the enterprise is much more than just a couple of people uh, or like a bunch of people in a room having meetings. Uh, for me, an enterprise is a, um, cohesive ecosystem that creates value for the people that work there and also uh, um, uh, the, the people outside of the enterprise where, where the enterprise does services for. Um, it's a highly advanced technological machine where people work together, they have different roles, they have the different outlooks, different skills, and together they create an amazing product for their customers. And that is what I think an enterprise is. So for me now, an enterprise doesn't look like this. It looks like more like this. <laughs> this is an enterprise. It's an ecosystem. If, if people don't work together, what happens to the enterprise? It falls apart or it crashes. You know what happens with this thing. Um, and it's, it's a fun story because when I started my career uh, a decade ago, um, we, the, the people that were there, the technologist and the, the lead developer, he called me Georgie LaForge. And I didn't know what Georgie LaForge was. I wasn't a Star Trek fan. But he commended me that I can come up with like uh, very uh, good technological solutions in a short amount of time. And now that I'm like looking at this whole endeavor, what I've been doing and stuff like that, I feel like a Georgie LaForge. There's this guy. Kind of look like him if you look at it. <laughs> Thank you. But we also have other people, of course, different roles. This is the frontline risk that we have at the Rabobank. Bank. These are the security guys. They are very strict. They vary to the point, but they are fair. Because understand, with an enterprise, there's a lot of uh, problems that can happen, and you don't want to uh, basically bring the enterprise down. And we also have another role. These are the architects. And this is what I see. This uh, Geert Jan, if you have seen Geert Jan, he's right there. <laughs> kind of looks like him, him too. <laughs> but yeah, he really. <laughs> yeah, so he really makes sure that we do the right thing. Because he understands not only low level, but also what happens on top. He speaks with management and also the people above that, which is very important to make sure the enterprise keeps on flying around. All right, a little bit about myself. So yeah, I, uh, I'm Sharon Noitmeer. I'm an SRE at heart. I've been doing this, for, as I said, for more than a decade now. Uh, I worked at uh, some mo notable companies like uh, Spotify back in uh, 2013. I then, um, I, I'm originally from uh, the Netherlands, but I'm born in uh, Suriname. I, uh, so I worked in Sweden. Then I went to London, worked for Palantir Technologies. I started my own company there as well. Did a lot of cool things, all the way from uh, bare metal, uh, putting it in the racks and making sure that the fiber channel is working, the Cisco switches are working, everything is redundant, everything is working uh, fine and dandy, and the monitoring system is in place, and backups as well. And I just basically grew from there to 
um, the SRE that I am right now, I write a lot of automation, I write a lot of Go, I uh, do software engineering, but mostly on the architecture. And now as well uh, with uh, Rabo, we're at the forefront to transfer to the cloud, and there I help the team, our team, Team Vikings, together with also TCS, to make sure that we get the, um, the application that is now working on-premise, and we want to basically get the application to the cloud. And TCS has helped a lot there too. And why am I showing this particular picture? So you can see this commit has been made by me in August 2018. This is the first time I actually wanted to deploy Kubernetes in a bank. The bank was Network International, it's a bank in Dubai. And I was there and basically wanted to first get me to install Kubernetes on premise. I thought, okay, that's a, uh, it's gonna be a difficult ask because they have a lot of policies there, a lot of things that you can do. You cannot just pull images from Docker Hub with your Bitcoin miners in there and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of difficult. But within a week, with having also first line risk there on the phone, I basically installed Kubernetes in a week on premise uh, in the Network International, in the bank. That was the first time, that was in 2018 the beginning of 2018. And when I did that, I'm like, yes, let's use the cluster. And then he said, no, we have to do this in the cloud. So here we are, we were using uh, AKS engine, and actually it was not AKS engine, it was called ACS engine. AKS really wasn't generally available at that time. So what Microsoft did is they open sourced the engine that basically installs Kubernetes for you on Azure but it was not ready for a bank. And why was it not ready for a bank? Yeah, you can see here right now, there's a nil pointer. When you want to use hardened images, and that's what you want to use when you're in a bank, you want to make sure that you're secure, you want to use your own images. But if you use your own images and you install Kubernetes, what happens? It crashes. Why? Because you didn't check your pointers. So I needed to make sure that that didn't happen. So. I made this commit, and the same day it got merged, and we could actually continue to deploy Kubernetes in the bank, which is great. And this is what I call pushing the envelope, because basically, AKS was not ready for the financial industry at that point in time, without this particular single line of code. <laughs> All right, thank you. So. The enterprise is not only, Kubernetes in the enterprise is not only a technological challenge, it's first and foremost a organizational challenge. You cannot just go in and then install a cluster, have a public load balancer exposed, all your S3 buckets exposed, and then think you can run a bank like that. Before you know it, you're hacked, and then you have to pay some, like, uh, I don't know, some ransomware money to make sure that you get your data back. So to make sure that we don't make silly mistakes, because like the number one mistake is like open S3 buckets and for Kubernetes, I thought uh, like I heard a different talk uh, not so long ago. There were like one million open API endpoints in the wow. Isn't that crazy? So we don't want that to happen at the Rabobank. So what do we have? We have a bunch of enterprise roles, people, groups, we have the Cloud Competency Center, the CCC, an incredible team at the Rabobank. What they do is they help you to make sure that you make the right choices inside of your AWS account. So you don't open up like uh, uh, the API endpoint for everyone. But also, if you do something that is silly, there are automated tools to make sure that that silliness won't uh, actually become a problem because if you create a public load balancer, they make sure that it automatically gets deleted. I already talked a little bit about first line risk. It's very important, the first line risk, make sure that uh, all the policies are um, also uh, in place so we don't uh, expose the Kubernetes cluster or actually anything in the AWS environment or any actual environment, Rabobank is multi-cloud. So we make sure that no problems happen or the risk is at least mitigated or we accept so certain types of risk. We have identity and access management we have to make sure that we have all the accounts, people who can access the cluster, who can do the certain things. You have to make sure that um, like a group of people can access the cluster. We have people from TCS right here. They can also access the cluster in a particular way. There's a whole group of people that make sure that you get the right identity and access. We have the infrastructure architect, the solution architect, the business architect, and much more. Those are all people making sure that the enterprise stays afloat. All right. 
the placement in the investment stack. So what are, are we actually doing, right? Why do we have Kubernetes? As I mentioned before, we want to make sure that the um, investments back office, the, 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 blue circle, the, the blue square right there, that is basically that what we want to run. That is the whole back office if you want to do, for example, investment portfolios, ordering corporate actions, payments, these are all things that are being handled by the back office. There are connections to Euronext. Uh, some of y'all probably know what Euronext is. This is where you can place your orders and hope for execution. And this needs to now run on top of Kubernetes. We had it on-premise before. When you go in with Rabo and you have like your, your, um, your phone and you want to create or you want to start or open an investments account, this is what you see. You go through the whole stack and in the end, you come with like the complex workloads where the investment back office runs on Kubernetes and the red part, this is where I come in or we come in as a team to make sure that that is good and that the functional teams can consume that. All right, next, the application architecture. Well, this is something that looks very complicated. I'm not going to go into details, but just to give you a view of like how complex this is. There you see all the connections from the external side come in and all kinds of things are being hit and being talked like, we, we run now with like um, 40 transactions per second, but you can imagine any one transaction can multiply into like five or even 10 times as much because it propagates across the systems and different systems need to do uh, uh, different things so the client can be helped. So metrics, so we have 19 systems integrated. We have 44 APIs provided to the front end applications, eight different communication protocols and 70 different types of batch processing. And that's all in a nutshell what you saw in the picture before. Now some fine-grained components. I'm myself particularly interested in the Kubernetes part and what are you running? So these are all the components that you're running. This is the DevOps, uh, that's it's the, the DevOps uh, uh, squad that we, that we have. But so basically we have like, we have Splunk, we have Dynatrace, Amazon CloudWatch, that's the monitoring side. To deploy Kubernetes, we use Terraform and customize. That's basically the building blocks to deploy Kubernetes on. So Terraform to deploy Kubernetes, and then we use Customize to do the rest. And inside of the cluster, of course, we have Flux. What's, where's Flux on our list right there? Um, right there. So we use Flux CD, so we use GitOps to make sure that all the credentials stay in store inside the cluster and the state is reconciled with the Git repository and also the Docker registries. All right, a little bit more metrics. So we have three accounts and five environments. Well, it's, we have more accounts with three active accounts at this point of time and five environments. How can it be? Because like normally I would do like one account per environment but it's a different setup that we have here because if you, have to, if you create an, uh, an account, you have to go through the whole process. There's a lot of people, as I said before, involved to make sure that we do the right thing. And it's much easier if you want to create a functional environment that you can do that on top of the Kubernetes cluster because you can use your Kubernetes to run different types of workloads. So why not just have like different node pools that you can use that are specifically uh, used for a particular functional environment? So we have performance tests, we have uh, acceptance environments, we have all kinds of other environments for, like, uh, for the staging uh, uh, account. We have the development account, of course, this is where the initial uh, CI CD process starts from the Rabo side, and we have also production. Right now, it's just uh, one, uh, one environment, production, but it will be split in multiple environments. You see also the amount of nodes that we're using, and staging has the most nodes, 51 nodes, 720 cores, and uh, almost uh, three terabytes of uh, memory. So yeah, this is a bit, it's a pretty expensive, but yeah, we're, we are in the enterprise, and so the, um, the operational expense is, might be a little bit higher, but the capital expense is much lower because you don't have to use any on-premise systems anymore. As I mentioned before, we do GitOps. This uh, animated GIF, so immediately you see what happens. Flux is running inside a cluster. We have a developer. A developer changes the Git repository, and what happens, Flux makes sure that uh, the system is reconciled, but we also have uh, Docker images. And if there's a new Docker image that gets pushed to the registry, 
Flux will automatically deploy that image to uh, the Kubernetes cluster. All right. So we are now in the process of going to the cloud. It has not been an easy process. It's actually a very complicated process. There's a lot of things that we've touched. There's a lot of things, uh, a lot of communications that we need to have. It's also, there's also technological challenges. What I see in a lot of companies is what they, what they do usually is they make their own bespoke solution on top of Kubernetes. We already have a lot of YAML files, and what they then do is they create a, a template system to make sure that uh, you don't repeat yourself. And I think that that is not the really the right solution to go. I know Helm internally used templates, but otherwise, I wouldn't use any templating system to, uh, uh, um, to do YAML. I wouldn't make anything bespoke. So what would, what, would, what would we do different now? We would, first of all, I would like standardize as much as possible. So there, there are multiple groups of people in the Rabobank Bank that are using Kubernetes. Uh, at least two of them are using Customize. One of them has a bespoke solution. And as we have uh, seen in the talk before, you want to remove your unicorns. You want to move fast. You don't want to have uh, 50 planes that you can make in a year. You want to have 50,000, right? How do you achieve that? How do you get agility? Is by standardizing. So maybe not everyone would like that. You have some rock star engineers. They want to do their own thing. And of course, I understand that's also very possible, a very, like, like everyone wants to do that. But for an enterprise, that just doesn't scale. So standardize. The other thing that I find very uh, important to do is involve enterprise expertise earlier. We've made some decisions. So inside of the cluster, we're also using Argo. Argo is a big part of our CI CD system, and it's a tremendous tool. It works very well, it works very fast. You can do a lot of things with that. It's a versatile tool. But inside of Rabobank, we also use Azure DevOps. And the pipelines are compliant. There are security checks. And what's going to happen now, if you're using a tool like Argo, it needs to go to a process to accept that tool. It's a, 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 crowd, a cloud risk assessment that you need to do before you're going to run a tool inside of the cluster. Because any tool that you get from, from, from Docker Hub or anywhere else could be compromised or has a maybe not the right security posture. You want to verify that first before you're going to roll that out. So these, these decisions you need to make not lightly. Let's see, so um, the next one is start processes earlier. So if you use something, a tool that is not uh, necessarily Rabo endorsed like Argo, what you can do is start the process early. If you want to properly risk assess that tool, you have to make sure that you go through the proper channels. And it can take three months, yes. There's a lot of people that need to sign off on things. Uh, people need to actually check. People will check the code, people will do pen testing. Uh, people look at, uh, at even the maturity of the project and the impact of what you're doing there. And another thing is very important is the consideration for day two operations. Now, what is day two operations? You have first day operations. That's basically when you install the, the cluster, when you um, install all the tools, when you just start doing things. But you have to maintain the cluster. You have to have updates, you have to make, uh, you have to uh, install new tools, you have to make sure that you are with the right API versions, etc. So the tools that you pick right now, they only don't exist now, but they also exist for your predecessor. So you have to make sure that you also take them into account. Let's see. So there are a bunch of key takeaways. Now first of all, keep it simple. See, a lot of people wanted to make a lot of interesting things, but I like boring now. I'm now like 36 years old. Some people think it's not that old, but for me, I've been in, the, in this industry for too long, and I don't think uh, and like new and shiny is not, it doesn't excite me as much as actual having some stability, making sure that we uh, can continue the business, even though if someone, has, uh, if someone can't uh, fix your tool and someone is very good at the tool and it's not there, you should be still be able to fix that. Don't tamper YAML, I can't say that enough. Don't create your own bespoke systems. And for Kubernetes, it's very important to extend your base infrastructure configuration. So don't template it, extend it, and use customize. 
And I also want to show you a little bit about customize. Let's see. Oh, now I have to mirror my screen, right? Let's see if I can do that. Uh, hey. What if I stop this presentation for a second? Or can I just mirror the screen? I'll just mirror the screen. So who of y'all is familiar with Customize? Nice, very nice. Who isn't? Okay, okay. There's a lot of people not raising their hands, so I don't know. Who knows what, like, like what, what is Customize? I will like shortly explain that. Customize is a tool that basically allows you to patch your YAML. And patch, so, it's, uh, so you have a base YAML, and you can basically say, well, I want to take this base YAML, but I want to extend it with a little bit of this, with this snippet. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What's that? Uh, I think you can. Wait a second. <laughs> Extend. No, I have it here. I have it here. Mirror for built-in display. There we go. There we go. Hey. If you want to check it out, because I don't know what this thing is doing. Yeah, come over. If you go to displays. Oh, displays, where's displays? Yeah, this one. Yeah. It should be. Uh, That's meter? Extended yeah. display. And then you can. Mirror for display, mirror. yes. Yeah. Yes. Right? Wait yeah, a sec. Oh, when you go there, then it, does, it doesn't do that. Okay, let me just fix it real quick by doing this. Yeah, you got it? Wait a sec. Yeah. Because it does this again. Main display. It might be PowerPoint messing it up. What's that? It might be PowerPoint messing it up. Yeah, PowerPoint's messing this up right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe stop the presentation and then. Yeah. I have to check it here now. Yeah. Stop. What is this? Oh, but this is up here. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> All right. So, very simple. This is. Uh, so Flux, if you have to first install Flux. And we have installed Flux. I think this is visible for everyone. Let me just uh, make sure that it's a little bit bigger. So this basically is uh, the basic uh, uh, Flux configuration that you can use to say, OK, I want to like, um, already uh, configure the Git repository. And uh, this is what you do in dev. We have a, a directory called Kates, short for Kubernetes, clusters, dev. So that happens. And so if you see here already, we have here the uh, directory called case base. This is where all the YAML is in, uh, resides in. And then we have the case directory, right? Clusters. And then we have dev, just like you see here in the path, right? And then if you look at, for example, all the applications that are installed, um, I'm now actually showing RFTM. RFTM is it's not RTFM, it's RFTM. <laughs> it's not a typo. It's a Rabobank File Transfer Manager. So, of course, you can't just like, uh, like exfiltrate data or infiltrate data. You need to go through a system. And there are different endpoints. You have like S3 buckets, but also Linux machines. You have all kinds of like other like endpoints, but you want to control from one place how data gets, gets from outside of Rabobank inside of Rabobank. And so that is RFTM. RFTM has an API, so you can configure RFTM. And I wrote a little controller there. So this is like an app that I, that I install on a cluster. And so, but basically, you see here that we're now, uh, when we now um, went, to, uh, went to customize, you saw that we went to uh, app, the, uh, like the cluster is dev. And then we have some apps here. And here, you see that I'm pointing to Kate's app dev RFTM. So let's see. Right, case, apps, dev, and then we go to RFTM. Here we have a deployment. But look at this. This doesn't look like a full deployment, right? This is a partial file. You only see what is, what is specified is basically the image here. So we have an image specified. 
but where does this come from? So there's a customization, and then you go two directories up, point, 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 base, RFTM. So you go up, base, and then we go to RFTM, and here's the full deployment. And so with customize, it's very easy. You go from this full deployment, this is what you have, this is full deployment, but in the end, the only thing that you do for dev is you change uh, where the image is coming from, because you have to point to the repository or to the registry of dev, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm pointing to the dev registry. So, um, and there's another thing. So you've seen that I've installed an RFTM controller. So the, mo the nice thing about an enterprise is that it is a big ecosystem of technology and people that come together to create value. But they also, so what they also do is they create a value for people internally inside of the company. So, so we have a, a thing called RFTM, but it does, it's not only a GUI, it, it also has an API. And what you can do in the enterprise, there is a bunch of APIs available, and you could build all kinds of controllers for the APIs that are already there. So this is, this is the first controller in the Rabobank that is actually using an internal API, and I think a lot more will follow. This is an amazing process. So you can imagine if there are a bunch of APIs to do all kinds of things in your enterprise, you can not only use Kubernetes to deploy your applications, you can use Kubernetes to basically configure your entire enterprise. So working for an enterprise basically becomes like the Starship enterprise. You can just go and sit behind your laptop and do all the things from the console. And in the end, you don't even have to necessarily communicate to all these kind of people because you can just uh, create your, your YAML uh, objects and uh, communicate with the enterprise like that. So I think this is good for now. I still have something to, let's see, uh, here we go, wait a sec. Wait a sec, I need to make sure that this is gone. I actually need to check it over there. Is it almost, almost? Yes. Oh, another one, you gotta be kidding me, man. There we go. All right. So, one thing. Um, show of hands, how many people are actually working for an enterprise right now? An enterprise organization? Okay, and uh, of those hands that are up, uh, who is not using Kubernetes at this point? Okay, you guys. Okay, so that's a very interesting thing. Um, if you wanna know how to convince your company to work, uh, to use Kubernetes, First of all, you have to understand, respect your organization, right? A lot of people think like, okay, the organization is stupid, they don't use Kubernetes and that's super bad and uh, we're gonna just fight the organization. That's not what you do. You work with the organization, they're there for, for a reason. You make sure you follow the process, you talk to the right people, get people together, make sure that they understand what you're doing. You also understand the perspective of management. Like I can say all kinds of things to Rabobank. I can say, yeah, we need to use Kubernetes, we need to do this or that or whatever. But in the end, uh, management has a whole different mindset. They don't know about containers, they don't know about clusters. They wanna know, does the business work? Can it continue to work? Are we in control? Uh, are we not creating uh, like weird risks? Like you need to ensure business continuity. And you need to make the case that the Kubernetes makes sure that you can actually have a better business continuity. And if that doesn't work, you just basically ask for forgiveness because you're just gonna do it anyway, roll it out, maybe show something, and then you can beg for permission later. And if that doesn't work, you should apply somewhere else. We're hiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sherwin. Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, uh, and uh, I, was just, I was just talking with, uh, with Heert from Rabobank, that the, the very first item, respect your, uh, the organization, seems kind of obvious, but it isn't. Bringing something in new requires uh, courage, of course, but also respect for those that were not thinking it or that didn't want it. So you have to have the, your own way to, exactly. to t talk it through. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah, very you're good. welcome. Again, thank for, you. Uh, for the chairwind. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Where are you going? Stay here. 
Questions, <laughs> please. Yes, we have one over there. We have one. Uh, that, skip that one. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation. I do have one question. Uh, I'm here. All the way over here oh, in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I agree with the not templating your YAMLs, um, but what about templating your TFR files? Templating your TFR files? Um, for what purpose? I'm just asking you. Yeah, you could well, tell Okay, me. let's say um, I want to have one code base from Terraform from which I can inject different TFR files for different environments, for instance. Yes, so you can do that. Yeah, I know, but You're allowed. What's, your, what's your thought on that? Well, like TFR files is kind of different, right? The, the problem with templating YAML is you can create all kinds of problems there. This white space, that, that is, an, is an issue. Uh, you don't know what it looks like in the end. But TFR files is basically just a, a flat file. So I think that's perfectly fine to template. You don't have the same problems with just a flat file that as it is with YAML. Okay, we can, we can talk about that then. Okay, that's fine. Let's do that. Sounds like a threat. <laughs> Bring it on. Hey, thanks for your talk. Uh, there was a diagram with all of the components and then some of the things that were uh, pinned at a certain version, like Helm and Splunk and so on. What is the update strategy for those components, if there's any? That's a very good question. Um, there is no update strategy as of this point. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah. No, so like, yeah, the, basically you can do that by hand, of course, but that's not going to work. Like you have also, like, because we, we're using GitOps, you can use something like Dependabot to upgrade certain types of things, but not everything can be easily upgraded. So for, we have to look at it per, per component on how to see and how specifically for day two operations. And that's something that, because we're in the forefront of the Kubernetes world and the cloud uh, transformation, we are also looking at uh, things like this and how to do that correctly. Sherwin, we have space for two more questions. Are you okay to take them? If yeah, yeah, sure. There you go. Hi. Uh, I think you already mentioned, but I missed it. But probably, uh, how are you managing secrets uh, in the cluster? I, I didn't see it. Ah, uh, yeah, good question. Because so you are using GitOps, so are you using kubeseal or? Yeah, or well, we used kubeseal in the beginning. But that's like, uh, a, 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 there's a lot of overhead to kubeseal because you have to uh, um, uh, cycle the keys and stuff like that. We don't want to do that. We're now using external secrets. So most secrets are in the secrets manager of in AWS, but we expose those secrets via external secrets. So it's, for, it's uh, in the cluster so the application can just uh, consume those secrets. Last is question, Sherwin. Yeah. Is there anything you can share about what your organizational team dynamics look like to enable all those repositories and all those structures? Because uh, if you're trying to build these for developers, if you're trying to enable developers, then uh, are there any structures in place to have them uh, productive, uh, for example? Um, let me rephrase that question. So you want to know basically how we um, expose the cluster so other people can consume it easier? Yeah, how, um, how you enable your developers to release to Kubernetes? Okay, yeah, so for this particular instance of the Kubernetes cluster that we have right now, um, everything is coming from offshore, so the developers don't necessarily interact directly with the cluster. They basically deliver the, the tarball and we make sure with our CI CD system that a Docker image is automatically created. So they don't interact with the cluster like that. However, um, we are looking at forming a platform team, which we're going to answer that exact question. But conversations are still ongoing. Thank you very much, Sherwin. Um, please, one more for Sherwin. OK. Um, please do not leave the room. We are going to have, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you one communication, service communication. We're going to do one group photo with the whole team. And then we have our last mysterious keynote speaker. Kelsey Hightower. Uh, sorry, yeah. what's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the mic is still on? Um, OK, so uh, we are going, uh, after, after the last keynote, we are going to go, everyone, we're going to be serving drinks in the sponsor area.
Uh, and around six, maybe a little bit later, we are, there are too many Italians in the team to make it on time. <laughs> so <laughs> we, are going to, we are going to move and have Three. our barbecue, yeah. vegan barbecue uh, in the bar area. Okay? Thank you.